Good morning to you and welcome. It's good to have you join with us today. Now, you may have seen in the news that even with the lockdown restrictions being reduced slightly, uh, groups are going to be limited in size and in what they can do. And at the moment we hear that churches are going to be limited to around 30 people with no singing and no refreshments. So for the time being, our Sunday gatherings are going to continue as they are although we will look for ways of meeting together in other ways as we are able to do so on other occasions. Now today we're going to continue our walk through the Book of Acts and after we've had our first song, Graham is going to read the second part of Acts chapter 5 to us. Before he does though, we will sing with Matt Redman, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Your heart. 
Acts chapter 5 verses 17 to 42. The apostles persecuted. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there, so they went back and reported. We found the jail securely locked, with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts, teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and saviour, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honoured by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Theodos appeared claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census, and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone, let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. 
Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Thank you, Graham. We've already seen how it hasn't taken long for the new believers to go from enjoying the favour of all the people in Acts chapter 2 to being arrested and imprisoned for speaking about Jesus. So why did the Jewish leaders think the new church was such a threat? And why does the same thing happen today? Why are Christians jailed and killed for holding on to their beliefs in a God who saves? Initially, the Jews considered the followers of this new way, this new life, as the angel put it, to be just a new Jewish sect and so could be dealt with by their internal temple discipline procedures for those who didn't follow the rules. But clearly that was unsuccessful. They put the disciples in jail and God released them. They told them to stop talking and the more they did so, the more the disciples preached about Jesus. But talk of a new king was dangerous. In the Roman Empire, Caesar was Lord. Gamaliel was the realistic one among them. He was a renowned Jewish scholar. and still revered among the Jews today. His fame is summed up in the words recorded in the Jewish Talmud, which says, When Gamaliel the Elder died, regard for the Torah, the Jewish law, ceased, and purity and piety died. And he's the one who said, For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it's from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will find yourselves fighting against God. Today, the systems of the world are still trying to suppress God in the same way and still finding it's impossible to prevent the gospel from spreading, finding that it is from God and not of human origin. Just And just as the Jewish leaders feared losing control, the same thing happens today. For instance, in North Korea and other communist countries, authoritarian governments seek to control all religious thought and expression as part of a comprehensive plan to control all aspects of political and civic life. These governments hold some religious groups as enemies of the state because they hold beliefs that may challenge loyalty to the rulers. Jesus is Lord and a new king is still dangerous. When I was at New Wine a couple of years ago, we heard from a North Korean lady called Hai Wu who had escaped. And here is her story. When I arrived at the camp, I was shocked by the sign on the gate. It said, do not try to escape, you will be killed. Every day in the camp was like torture. We had to get up at five o'clock. First, the guards counted us. We received only a few spoons of rice as breakfast. Then we had to walk outside the camp to walk on the land. When we were finally done, there was a criticism session in the camp where you had to explain what you did wrong that day and accuse others too. After we ate a little bit, there was a long session of ideological training. It was so hard to stay awake. At 10, we finally could go to bed. I often felt afraid and alone in the camp. I prayed to God that He helped me survive. I prayed for the opportunity to one day tell my story about this camp and God's work in North Korea. When people died, the guards burned the corpses and scattered the ashes over the road. We walked that road every day, and each time I thought, one day the other prisoners will walk over me. I meditated on Psalm 23 every day, even though I was in the valley of the shadow of death. 
I did not feel anything. God comforted me every day. God gave me the strength to help other prisoners. I shared my food with sick people and I helped to wash their clothes. God even encouraged me to tell some prisoners about Him. Five people came to faith and we held secret gatherings in toilets and other hidden places. They were on the edge of death and I could give them a message of hope. All of us survived the camp because we looked after each other. After a few years in the camp, I was released. When the gate opened, I ran through it and I did not stop running. Not once did I look back. God had heard my prayers. He helped me escape to South Korea. For the first time in my life, I experienced the freedom to do what I want, to believe and to live. My life has been very hard, but Jesus is always watching over me. Thanks to Open Doors, I can now tell my story. Please pray for the prisoners in North Korea and the Christians who are not free to worship Him and risk their lives every day. Before we close today, we'll take time to pray for those who are still suffering because they know, just as Peter did, that we must obey God rather than human beings. And here's a Pakistani Christian telling us a little bit more about that and suggesting how we might pray. I am Ayub Masih, a Christian in Pakistan. This year my country was again ranked as one of the five most dangerous places in the world to be a Christian. But I don't need to see the report because I have seen the tears, the blood and suffering of my people. One day I asked God why my Christian families and their children are suffering, why he did not do anything for them, for their liberty, for their dignity, for their rights and even for their protection. And you know, God took me to Exodus chapter 3. Moses saw a bush burning in the wilderness. When Moses approached the bush, God said, मैंने अपने लोगों की जो मिस्र में है मुजल्लत देखी और उनकी फरियाद जो आमिलों के सबब से है सुनी और चूंकि मैंने उनके दुख को मालूम किया मैं उतरा हूं कि उन्हें मिस्रियों के हाथ से छुड़ाऊं इन माय पर्सनल लाइफ एक्सपीरियंस आई हैव नेवर सीन अ बर्निंग बुश बट आई हैव सीन द बर्निंग चर्चेस बर्निंग होम्स and even people being roasted for their Christian faith in Pakistan. God does see and hear the suffering of my people and my brothers and sisters. And God said, I am sending you. Like Moses, I questioned, who am I? I am just a you, Masih. And Pakistan is a dangerous place. I care for my persecuted family because I am a servant of the Most High and I believe God is with me. Pray for your Christian brothers and sisters who are serving the persecuted families and pray that you will be inspired by their courage and their faithfulness to be obedient to God's call and serve the hurting around you. As I told you last week, we're going to take communion together today. So I suggest that if you'd like to join in and you haven't got some bread and juice prepared, then you pause the video now and go and find some. As Baptists, we don't believe that it's necessary to have an ordained priest present to serve communion. We all have equal access to God. We are a holy priesthood. And so although it is much nicer to celebrate together as the family of God, it's also perfectly acceptable to be an online family because God is present in all of our homes. And as we think of each other and of other Christians known to us, 
as we pray for them and know that they pray for us. We are still a community, a believing community. We still do break bread together. And in fact, if we look beyond our local congregation, we can remember that we break bread with a bigger family, with that worldwide church, many of whom are breaking bread just as we are today, including those who are persecuted and who never know what it is to meet openly, to sing, to gather in large groups. Our communion service generally consists of four elements. Firstly, confession, where we acknowledge that we fail daily to live up to both God's standards and our own. Secondly, a statement of belief that we can all affirm. And thirdly, a prayer of thanksgiving. Fourth and fourthly, the taking of bread and wine in accordance with the instructions given to us by Paul. So that will be our pattern today. Firstly, confession. We know that we're forgiven people, but as we come before a holy God, we humbly come, recognising our sins. And so here is a prayer that you can say with me. The words will come up on the screen. Let's pray. Holy God, we come before you in humility, for we do not live as we ought. We do not love you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We do not love our neighbour as ourselves. And so we pray in all humility that you will change our hearts and minds, that you will show us again how to love others the way you love us, that you will put power and courage in our hearts to do your will. And this we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Peter said to the crowd, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. So hear the good news today. God so loved the world that God sent Jesus to us not to condemn the world, but in order that we might be saved, healed and forgiven through him. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Amen. If we were together today, we'd probably have said the words of the Apostles' Creed together. So join me now, with me now in saying these words which declare what it is that we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We remember that Paul the Apostle wrote letters to congregations throughout places we now call Greece and Turkey and Macedonia, and they were the first remote worship resources. Our online service has a long heritage. And the communion words sent to the church at Corinth were these. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, that's for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
So now a prayer of thanksgiving and then we'll take bread and wine together. Lord, as we take this bread, we remember that you are the bread of life. You feed our souls, you nourish our hearts, you give us sustenance to run the race before us. And as we break the bread, we thank you for your love for us and for the grace you show us afresh each day. We thank you with all our hearts for the great price you paid when you were crucified on the cross for us. And just as the yeast has caused the bread to rise, you rose again, triumphant over death, as Lord of Lords and King of Kings, forever our Saviour. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So take your bread and remember with thanksgiving that Jesus died for you. And Lord, as we drink this wine, we remember that you are the giver of life. You are forgiveness. You bring deep peace to our souls and your love flows within us. As we pour out this wine, we see your sacrifice poured out for us. We notice the depth of your goodness and the pain you suffered for us. The price you paid to set humanity free. Yet just as the tombstone rolled away to unleash the risen Lord, your light shines in our hearts now, extinguishing all darkness to release heaven's blessings upon us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So let's drink together and remember as we do so that we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And now a final prayer, which we can say together. Spirit of Christ, you have blessed our tables and our lives. May the eating of this bread give us courage to speak faith and act love, not only in church buildings, but in your precious world. And may the drinking of this cup renew our hope, even in the midst of pandemic. And we pray particularly today for those who always have to meet, as we are today, in small groups. And especially for those who meet in fear and secrecy, would you give them courage today to live for you? We pray, as the video asked us to, for our brothers and sisters who are serving the persecuted church. And we pray that we will be inspired by their courage and faithful to be obedient to God's call to serve the hurting around us. Wrap your hopeful presence around all whose bodies, spirits and hearts need healing and let us know your compassion and love and share it with all those whom we meet. Amen. And now let's say together the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And let's say the grace as we think of each other and commit each other to God's protection. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. We'll close today with a familiar hymn sung in this version around the world, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And until next time, may God bless you.
survey the wondrous cross. Oh. Oh